Welcome back to Following Know It On, a Stormlight podcast. This week is episode 42, and we have chapters 70 through 75. We're going all the way to the end of part four of Words of Radiance. Back up to the Way of Kings, part four was definitely our climax, our, our climax part. What I'll ask you guys for your two words here in a second, but just a quick... Uh, a quick comparison between part four of Words of Radiance and part four of The Way of Kings. Uh, I'll start with you, Paul. Uh, did it live up to part four expectations of The Way of Kings? Yes or no? If I'm giving a one word answer, I'll say no. Okay. I would also say no if you were to ask me this question. Mm -hmm. Elliot? I, no is doing it a bit of an injustice, but but yeah, not 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 quite way of kings level but but very epic and justified it for for this book it was very fitting right climax I if agree. you will if i have to give my one word answer i'll say no but it was still very good right there was a lot of good things and i'm excited to unpack it the the key difference for me actually though is the fact that after part 4 of words uh, of way of kings there wasn't much left like we had resolved our big dilemmas. So there right. was definitely still more, but you, there wasn't like, you know, you weren't hanging on for stuff to still happen. In Words of Radiance, we're still hanging on for stuff that, that needs to happen. Like there's still stuff that we know has to get resolved before the end of the book. So it does feel a bit different kind of in just the, the way it's structured. Our page count is way higher too. Yes. We have a lot more chapters than we did in the Way of Kings for part five. All right, Paul, uh, two words for episode 42, uh, chapters 70 through 75. All right, my two words. I have love stricken. Okay, <laughs> love love stricken. I'm excited to get into that one. Uh, I'm excited. Elliot, do you have two words? Actually, this week I do not. I just have one word, so... I'm going to uh, with a second one, but my my one word is emotional. Emotional. I will I will follow up after that with uh, letters. It does not have to do with uh, these chapters specifically, but part four as a whole, and we will we'll talk about it uh, probably towards the end of the episode. But we can talk about uh, these four words and episode 42. Love stricken, Paul. Unpack it for me. What are we what are we doing here? I am so glad you asked. Okay. So they slightly go together, but not entirely. So I actually looked up the definition for stricken. And it, it basically just says the past tense of strike or the past participle of strike. Or as an adjective, like seriously affected by an undesirable condition or unpleasant feeling which this whole these whole chapters Shalon and Kaladin are kind of forced together forced to work together even though they're really like snooty towards each other for a long time they're kind of like forced through hardships to get along right um and so i would consider that a undesirable condition or unpleasant feeling <laughs> Uh, maybe towards each other. So so that was my main reason for doing that. And the love is kind of like love struck. Like right. there's kind of the illusion that they may develop feelings for each other at some point, which I I thought would be a, a thing that would happen. I did not see it coming up now. It just was like, a, oh, like, you know, as time goes on a book or two, like maybe there will be some interest there. But it was like, nope, like next next couple chapters like they're gonna be put in an oddly emotionally like 
state of growth with each other. Like they, right. they get very close very fast in summary. So yeah. that's my main reasoning. I'm I'm so glad you you brought that up, Paul, because honestly, like right off the bat, chapter seventy, I I even wrote in my notes. I was like, there's definitely some romantic tension going on here between the two, but I didn't want to bring it up just me like reading that into this chapter wasn't it wasn't here so i'm glad i'm not the only one that maybe kind of got that sense out of out of this segment the there's a very specific line i think it's probably what chapter 72 maybe where shalon and kaladin are finally getting along there's banter back and forth and shalon says i'm a I'm happy that we're down in the chasms because when we get out, Adolin will give me a big hug and maybe even let me kiss him. And then Kaladin says, oh, right, Adolin. That dampened my mood. <laughs> so Kaladin is certainly getting a little closer to Shallan here. I don't know if Shallan is getting closer to Kaladin, but Kaladin is certainly uh, getting closer to Shallan here. But we'll get there. She definitely, she definitely does. It, it's you know, it's the almost like a timid, like okay, we're forcing this together. But yeah, it, it's very much there on both sides. It's just like they can't talk about it. You know, they're not going to talk about it. Right. Um, one other thing I want to say before we really dive into the chapters, I feel like the from seventy to seventy five, like to the end of part four. And even like the few chapters before, like okay, they're going up to the shattered plains, bridge falls, they fall down, fight the cows and feed all, all this stuff. I feel like you can make this into an entire movie on its own. Oh yeah, like, animal, like this storyline, you could flesh f- like flesh this out into an actual movie, and it'd be pretty cool, honestly. Like this scene, and that's kind of what I've been thinking about and stuff. So, just side note, I think there's enough here to make a full movie like a good one yeah you kind of mentioned your word elliot did you want to mention anything else about emotional before we jump in yeah yeah definitely so this whole this whole stretch of chapters had me feeling the whole range of emotions like i went from absolutely like gut-wrenching horrified in the chapter where she kills her father to like I didn't cry. I did not cry. But, you know, starting to head that direction when we get told that Syl is dead, like potentially for good. And then you have like some of the funniest scenes I think we've seen in the entire Stormlight Art banter that's going back and forth between Shallan. And then like just this triumphant epic moment where Kaladin and Shallan come out of and just drop the gem heart at, at Dalinar's feet. It was like, yes, you know? Yeah. It's like everything. It's like I laughed, I cried, I was horrified. It, the whole range, whole range. Yeah. Just a side note, and I'll I'll probably mention it when we get back uh, get back to chapter seventy five. But uh, Kaladin produces glory, Spren. He's rather proud of himself for killing a chasm fiend. So, uh, but we'll get there. All right. Just a what about your word? Uh I'm actually not going to talk about my word until after oh, we're done talking about the the, the chapters. Fair enough. enough. Fair enough. I will I'll keep chapter. letters letters to myself until until he'll, later in this episode. Us, he'll tell us like 2 months from now. Yeah, exactly. I already know. No, you'll you'll hear it at the end <laughs> of the episode. Okay. Okay. Sure. I'll so this has kind of has to do with this uh, uh, with this episode assuming a Roshar day is 24 hours as we know it on, on Earth their year is 500 days and they talk about it here because they're talking about the weeping and there's a thousand day cycle split into two years at the end of the thousand days there's the weeping and there is no high storm in the middle um, and then at the 500 day mark, there is also weeping, but there's a big high storm in the middle, like the big high storm. 
both Kaladin and Shallan are 20 in in this in this book. Adolin is 23. Now if you do the math, that tr- that turns out to either 27 or 28 in in earth years. I don't know if that's like intentional that they're supposed to be older than that this is assuming there's a 24-hour day like if there was less hours in the day then this changes but i don't actually know if kaladin and shallan are supposed to be 20 as we would know them or closer to 30 as we would know them i don't i don't know just some food for thought as we hop into a potential love triangle here between uh kaladin adolin and shallan that's a great thought I I guess you're also kind of assuming that people in the world of Roshar age at the same rate right. that, that we do here on B, like another factor there of, you know, no, they are actually older than, you know, a 20-year-old on Earth, but maybe perhaps they slower, so they're still equivalent. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. interesting thought. I had not, had not realized. I It just dawned on me. I think it was earlier today, and I was like, Wait, how old actually is Kaladin? Because the days are not not the same. Okay, chapter seventy. Uh, Kaladin and Shallan are in the chasms uh, from from last week. They've fallen into the chasms. They don't really like each other at this point, and there's some there's some banter going back and forth between them as we go through these chapters. And uh, Elliot, you have uh some of the funniest dialogue uh that we've seen in these books so far written in the uh in the outline here do you want to talk a little bit about it i'll I'll do you one better i'll share with you some of my my favorites because i actually did have to write down a few of the the highlights if you will but this is this is just a small of like some of the great dialogue that's in these these chapters and i'll be i'll be fully honest with you some of like the shallan quips or or joking has been fairly obnoxious in the past like they're super cheesy i know they're meant to be cheesy at times but it's like you know okay shallan grow up but some of her stuff in these chapters were downright hilarious like there is some great stuff in here stuff like well at least the companionship is pleasant for me for you (laughs) with the two of them yeah (laughs) right Mm -hmm. or i'm really not very witty you just happen to be stupid so it seems that way. And then I think my favorite of all was after they they take down the chasm fiend and she's cutting him out of the like mouth of it. He's like, you know, complaining about she's not going fast enough for something and she responds with, "Here I have a, a reasonably perfect specimen of a chasm fiend with only a minor case of being dead and I'm chopping it apart for you instead of studying it." Like, yeah. Just some great stuff. Grateful. Yeah. In in these chapters. Yeah, it's some good stuff. Only a minor case of being dead. Right? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this this chapter, and honestly, the chapters going forward from here is, like I said, you could make this into a full-length movie. I can just picture the, like, suspense as they kind of are, like, running and trying to evade this chasm fiend. Well, first there's the rising fear i guess of oh there's a chasm fiend around like we had to be careful and then they get chased and all this stuff and it just kind of has you on edge for a while um and it was some really cool imagery there and how they try to evade and and stuff like that and it's also kind of funny because neither of them knows the other can like surge bind or anything like that and Callan's situation is complicated but Kaladin is definitely not expecting Shalom to do anything, and he's kind of just like casually impressed, like, oh, she's keeping up well and things like that. And um stuff which is kind of cool and by the end bits. by the end of this part though, he is suspicious. There are there are a f- couple a couple lines where he says he actually asked the Stormfather um in one of the chapters uh, Shalon's uh, Shalon's a surge binder, isn't she? 
and he doesn't uh he doesn't answer he describes shallan pulling him into the cubby through the river as a surge of energy he specifically says surge in his mind and uh obviously he's seeing like these illusions that are running around while this chasm fiend is fighting and at Mm -hmm. first he's like wait what did i just do and (laughs) how did i do that and then realizes later oh wait that i don't think that was me that was her so he is he's not certain at like at all but he's he's definitely suspicious by the end of this uh this part he he knows i think i think he's I'd go further than suspicious and say that he's he's pretty sure by the end of this. The the only thing that maybe is still casting some doubt de- we'll talk about when we get to is her shard blade, actually. I want to talk about it when we when we yep. get there, but I think that's actually part of maybe a reason why he might not but we'll get to it. Kaladin accuses Shalon of being pampered and spoiled. And as these chapters go through, they get to know each other a little better. And Kaladin has a really cool quote or a thought about Shallan. And I'm, I'm going to read it and we can talk about the, the, surrounding, uh, uh, the surrounding context. But it's one of my, my favorite quotes in all of Words of Radiance. He saw it in her eyes, the anguish, the frustration, the terrible nothing that clawed inside and sought to smother her. She knew it was there, inside. She had been broken. Then she smiled. Oh, storms. She smiled anyway. It was the single most beautiful thing he'd ever seen in his entire life. How? he asked. She shrugged lightly. It helps if you're crazy. Come on. I do believe we're under a slight time constraint. She started down the chasm. He stood behind, feeling drained and oddly brightened. That comes right after the... There's a point in their conversation where Kaladin is like, you don't know what pain is. How can you How can you talk to me about what I've been through and try to console me about what I've been through when you don't know pain? And she turns to she stops and turns to him and says, "You don't think I know what it feels like to feel sorry for someone else that they are sharing the pain that I should be suffering in reference to what she's gone through with her father." And she explains it very clearly to him to the point where she proves to him that she's been there, and he he sees it, and then he realizes oh, she's actually been through way more than I'm giving her credit for. And she's still smiling, and that's awesome. It's, it's one of my favorite quotes in Words of Radiance. I'm, you read that, Trevor, because I, I definitely noticed that that passage there as well. And it, it, it comes up a couple times through this chapter, through these chapters, and I think really grows through these sections of chapters. He really... It, it, it dawns on him that he's been jumping to conclusions about Shalon specifically throughout all this. And, and she really proves to him that he's being a bit of a hypocrite here and that he's, you know, just assuming that she's been pampered and spoiled her whole life and has never been through hardship. And she really kind of brings the hammer down and shows him, oh, no, I, I've been through terrible things and by the end of this by the by the point where she's you know finished telling her story kaladin knows oh man she's been through way more difficult things than i ever have been and yet she still can put a smile on at the end of the, the day which kaladin can't really say that kaladin goes around with this you know their cloud above his head he keeps getting described as of just being this kind of dark and gloomy person and yet shallan is has been through worse and and still can put it not only like put a smile on her own face, she can bring light to others. If you kept reading where you where you had stopped, he ends up comparing her to how he feels happier. He feels like his day's just been brightened because of Shalon. And yet this is Shalon who is so broken. The fact that she's so 
broken and been through such terrible things, but yet can still be a, a light for Kaladin. Like that's really, really cool. Really yeah. cool. I agree. I gotta say though, it I, I'm a little bit torn there. Super inspiring, super awesome concept there. I'm a little bit torn and hung up on the fact though that Shalon doesn't really deal with her pain in the most healthy way. Right. Like Shalon does put a smile on. She is positive despite all the terrible things that have happened to her. But, and, and while yes, I think that is an absolutely a good thing, the fact that she can do that and really powerful that she can still be a light even when she's broken. At the same time, she kind of does that because she's suppressing her past. She's, She's ignoring what happened to her in order to be as positive as she she is. And I don't know that that's a great way for her to do that. So I think there's still there's a bit of unhealthiness there in the way that she does that, but but the overall concept I think is still really powerful. I definitely agree. And I actually think this is kind of I feel like we've talked a lot about how Kaladin has changed his ways of, of viewing Shalon and maybe reconsidering like Vlad eyes in general or people in general, because he's realized that he's made all these generalizations and it's not true. He kind of needed to like take a step back there. Um, but at the same time, I think Shalon is kind of getting things out of it. Like he said, she does put a smile on, but she doesn't necessarily handle this her her pain that well. Um I think this was good for her because she like talked a little bit about it. Cause I, I feel like her whole thing is she can't she won't talk about it. Um and I feel like that's kind of a step in the right direction, even though that's pretty small. Or n- nothing super major. Um but I was kind of happy about that, honestly. Like, Shalon kind of put everything on the table. To be fair, they were in a very much life or death situation. So it kind of forces it out of you. But, um, like, everything she did, she didn't, like, hold back, which I was really glad about. Because it almost bugs me a little bit. Like, whenever that nobody's, things will happen. Nobody's showing each other their powers. Yes, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. come on, please, like, go <laughs> ahead and stuff. And this was kind of like pull out all the stops for the most part there, um, which I thought was really cool. All right, let's address the uh, elephant in the room. Where is where, where's Syl? What happened to Syl? She doesn't. Oh, man. She doesn't show up at all we he, we have one reference of what sill might have been doing and another reference that sill is dead they the stormfather set tells kaladin you killed her so i gotta jump forward in my notes a little bit here we're jumping around a little bit but let's Let's do it. So chapter, so what is it? It's chapter 74 where mm-hmm. Kaladin actually talks to the Stormfather. And the, and you're right, Trevor. The Stormfather puts it in no uncertain terms. You killed her. She's broken. He even, you know, like the final word is, you will not ride my winds again. Like, oh, uh-oh. I, is is this it? it is, is Syl dead and, and gone? It, it seems like she might be. Okay, not to bring everything back to Zeth, <laughs> like I tend to do, but... Um, so the Stormfather seems very unhappy with Kaladin here. Reasonably so. Um, assuming nothing changes, which I, I'm skeptical about this i want to say that Syl is still alive she's just very weak and will come back um and things will be all happy again one day assuming that's not the case Syl is gone for good 
Kaladin can never search bind again. Uh, things like that. I'm wondering what kind of standings is Zeth on? Like, does he have a spren? We still don't know this. <laughs> it bugs me every day. <laughs> um, but, like, his story is so, like, complicated, or maybe that's why he was so adamant to not betray his Oathstone, because he would be breaking a bond with his spren, and the spren could, like, vanquish, vanish. Um, that's some reasoning. Maybe he understood that, and Kaladin didn't. But it just makes me wonder, like, what kind of terms is he on like i don't know like i feel like if you don't like kaladin and like kaladin's gonna break these bonds you really wouldn't like zeph as the, the things i'm thinking i don't know it, it's kind of complicated but yeah i'm sad about sill i'm still like hopeful that some way shape or form she'll be back Because what's what a, if Sil's not here? What am I reading for? Like, what's what are we doing this right, for? Like, right. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But where's um, the meaning in life? Your yeah, exactly your one reference that you get of Sil is Kaladin tries to draw in stormlight in the chasms, and he hears Sil crying. And so when the Stormfather tells Kaladin, "You killed her." he immediately contradicts that in his mind and says, no, I heard her crying. She's, she's not dead. It might just be him, you know, trying to cope, but that is, that's what you've been told so far. I think there's other, I think there's actually more reason to hope. And I'm going to cling on to this hope that we might see Syl again, that it actually comes from pattern in chapter 75 so if you keep going later pattern and shallan are talking and they're talking about the day of recreants when when the oaths were broken and the the spren were killed and but he kind of describes it a little bit more and if you read it it, it leaves a glimmer of hope for for sill i think he pattern specifically says that when when spren die they don't die like humans are return to be like a force of nature and shallan even asked she's like have you have you been able to like return any of those poor spren that that were former selves and and patterns like we've tried and it's never worked but he says but all of the original knights radiant are gone he he mentions that specifically and so my bit of hope that I'm going to cling to here is that Kaladin's not dead yet or gone. So if Kaladin's still here, perhaps there is some way to like repair his bond or to reawaken Sill. I, I would be willing to guess that this is going to take a pretty monumental effort, that this is going to have to be something that takes a very long time perhaps for Kaladin to earn her back if you will but i think i'm going to cling to the hope and maybe i'm just doing this so that i don't break down in tears for sill that there is a possibility that uh that kaladin can bring her back you, you are i'm really glad you caught that because i was going to bring it up if you didn't when we got there that uh pattern does make the distinction that well if only we had the one of their knights radiant maybe we could uh resurrect if for lack of a better term their spread, but we don't, so we can't. Yeah, there's no way Sil's gone. Like <laughs> Brando Sando would not do that to us. Brandy Sandy. Yeah, Branderson Sanderson. <laughs> Alright. I sure hope not. Actually, before we leave this though, I want to think about a little something else actually as well. I'm I'm struggling still, even after all this explanation, to figure out what exactly did Kaladin do to break her. I, I can't figure out if it's simply the fact we, we talked about this last episode. Is it simply the fact that he broke an oath that he like betrayed his honor? Or 
was it that moment as he's falling in the caves where he like forces Syl to give him Stormlight? Is that the betrayal that breaks her, or is it the the promising giving his word he couldn't keep the part that broke Syl? I don't That's know. a good question. My my guess is Yeah, so obviously things are really weak beforehand and we right. can I, I it's safe to assume I would say it's safe to assume that it's because of the double oath that's un unupholdable. That's not a word. But <laughs> uh, that he's unable to keep uh, because they talk about it directly. So it's like, no, you mm-hmm. can't do this. What are you doing? Stop it. You're hurting me kind of thing. Um, but I, I think that'd be pretty safe because obviously something happened for him to not die falling into the chasm. So I, I think it it's very accurate to say, not accurate, it's very plausible to say that maybe he like forced Surge binding somehow, like really dug in there and 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 went in to save himself, and maybe that was just like, yeah, very unjust, like selfish, even. Um. So yeah, I I would bank on that, but we don't know. Yeah. Trevor does, but he won't tell us. I bet he doesn't. He's Jerk. just bluffing. You're right. I'm bluffing. <laughs> This whole time, he's also a first-time reader, and he's just been bluffing. <laughs> That's my me. prediction. You got me. Yeah, <laughs> exposed. <laughs> he does actually. When are we come across something big? He's like, "Oh my gosh, I couldn't wait to tell you guys." Like, <laughs> Calden's a search binder. Can you believe it? <laughs> okay, I've been waiting so long. But actually, you you guys have no idea what has been rattling in my brain for however many months now and i'm just dying to tell you and i can't and i'm not allowed to and mm-hmm, that's the sure. whole point mm-hmm. of the podcast that i i can't tell you and yeah, we'll never know you better write it down now and time stamp it or something for me to believe you that you're not a first time reader <laughs> all right for for our our listeners and readers and list our listeners and viewers who have who have read the whole thing <laughs> I will, if you know, you know about uh, what what I'm referencing here. But just to prove Paul wrong, mm-hmm. I'll I'll leave it at that. I already gave my clue. Okay. Sure. Okay. Good one. Ha <laughs> ha. Yep. I don't know what you mean, so definitely I'm right about this. So we, we already know Trevor has a fantastic poker face, so it could be anything at this point. Yeah. It's because he's bluffing. It's just the whole point of it. Yeah, that's okay. You can have a perfect poker face if you're not hiding anything to begin with. If I haven't read exactly. it, exactly. Just yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not that hard. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we jumped around a little bit. I do want to go back to seventy one, and talk about Teft and Sigzel for at least a couple minutes here because we have been bridge four starved for quite a few pages now we've we've gotten a little bit of we got actually got a lot of moash lately and we've gotten some of the bridgemen show up here and there in the in the bodyguards and stuff like that i think we get like dabit and a couple other uh whatever's scar and it's a couple other ones but uh we don't actually have any bridge four content until chapter 71 where Teft and Sigzel are taking their time off to come stand at attention in front of Sadius's chasm where they would go down to do uh uh to do their sphere scavenging whatever back in the way of kings. And uh Dalinar comes and checks on them and says, "Yo, guys, I know why you're here, but he's dead." And Sigzel says, "No, sir. He's coming. He's going to come up that ladder, like he like he always does, and we're going to be here waiting for him." Um. So I I just have a, a soft spot for for Teft and Sigzel and most of Bridge Four. So I've I've 
I really enjoyed this uh, this couple pages we get here. I really like this scene as well for for two reasons actually. One, Tefton and Sigzilla are very dedicated to Kaladin and willing to sit out here. It mentions that Teft is on every shift. The fact that he set up a shift rotation, but actually Teft is on it. And man, they, they are really dedicated to Kaladin at this point. But more than that, they have like faith in him. That they know his abilities, right? And so they are 100% confident, without a doubt, oh, he's coming back. It's just a fact. We're going to be here ready for him when he does. You know? It, it's for them. And to, to the point where, like, Dalinar kind of misunderstands that and just kind of thinks that they're, like, in denial. You know, he's like, right. you know, he's not coming back, but I need to stand here, you know, kind of thing. Like, he he kind of misses it a little bit. Of He he understands, you know, wanting to be there for your, your dead captain, but he's just like, oh, well, I'll let you guys with it but that's not what they're doing there at all they 100 percent know oh he, no no he's coming back he is and we're gonna be here when he when he does so one reason two is is you have to look a little closer i love the fact that dalinar comes to check on them if yeah. you think about this the only thing down there is to make sure that they're taking care of themselves he says that he says I'm, I'm not down here to tell you you can't do this i'm down here to make sure that you're eating and sleeping right dalinar is in the midst of preparing for this massive like the most important plateau run invasion that they've done in the last years and he takes some time to go down and check on teft and sigzil at the edge of the chasms like dude that's super cool i love the fact that down i love dalinar uh, i agree wholeheartedly and a kind of like what i was saying in our last episode about Dalinar's character, like character wise and the things he does and the way he like stands for things and approaches things is probably my favorite out of our characters. Um and this is kind of another example of that. Um and, and I think it even signifies that Teft and Sigzel were like a little taken aback by it. So they know who Dalinar is. They've kind of been working under him and stuff. But I guess just that Dalinar noticed very specific to them like you need to take care of yourselves like take it like i understand i'm here for you but you have to take care of yourself pretty much and it was a very like a thoughtful thing and, and like intentional that you have to be paying attention almost so um i think that was a good moment i always appreciate that Do we want to talk about the Invisagers for a couple minutes here? So Teft and Sigzil, before Dalinar shows up, are having a heart-to-heart. -heart, uh, not very much to Teft's liking, because he doesn't like talking about his past. But Sigzil has a way of getting information out of people. And Teft is talking about his family. And how both of his parents were in this cult, he describes it, at, called the Invisagers. And they would put themselves in harm's way to try to produce Knight's Radiant surges in order to return the Knight's Radiant. So they were convinced that if, if they put themselves at risk, if they believed hard enough, I guess, that they could get these surges and save themselves before, they, before the rock dropped on them or whatever it is. Any, any thoughts here? This is kind of a weird, dark corner of Tef's past here. So when we first got the mention of the Envisagers, was it back in Way of Kings, actually, that they first came up? I think it's part two of Way of Kings. It's really early. Yeah. So when when, when Teft very first, it, it seemed like they could definitely be a group of good guys, if you will, you know, devotees of the Knights Radiant. Like, oh, okay, that, maybe that's, maybe they're, you know, adhering to the the honor and nobility of the Knights Radiant, even when the, the Voran Church has, you know, said that they're all betrayers or whatever uh, in this chapter we find out that is not the case these are right. not the, the the good guys um you know the rebellion no no the, these guys are and they are killing themselves to try and it mentions specifically trying to bring back the void bringers and the knights radiant 
yeah, these guys are creeping me out now. Do you guys... I'm glad you specifically remembered the Voidbringers because do you guys remember the conclusion that Shalon comes to when snooping on Amaram? Amaram has a bunch of maps of the Shattered Plains and after reading his notes, she says, wait, they're trying to bring back the Voidbringers. I did note I coming out of this chapter, I actually did think about that back to back to Amaram. I remembered that note. So that that begs the question, is Amaram an envisager? That might that might answer some of our questions. We've seen before that Amaram is completely convinced that Talonel is a herald. He he seems Correct. to very quickly believe in some of these more crazy things that maybe some other people kind of question, like Oh, are heralds even real? Or are our knights radiant? You know, did they really do those powers? Amram seems to be a believer. He seems to be someone who, like, totally, you know, without a second thought, believes in that kind of stuff. That might fit in with him being part of this cult, which is a scary thought. But yeah, that I think that could definitely point to the same thing. Some food for thought. He's alive, obviously. Could he have a spren, which was alluded to earlier, that could he be hiding some powers that he successfully manifested being a part of this cult? Because he certainly believes in heralds and knights radiant. He is... As Dalinar has given him the ceremonial, like, you are the head of the Knights Radiant. Could there be more to that? Like, what is, what's his story here, you know? I've thought about this a little bit, and we talked about it some before. Like, why is Amaram head of the, the Knights Radiant? And we kind of discounted a little bit as he's just an experienced, like, military leader. Right. Um, he, he's very high rank ranking officer i guess but i would very much believe it uh delinar was it delinar or alicar alicar like officially appointed him to this right he's like the one who does that maybe maybe it's delinar i think it's delinar yeah. um i mean there has to be a reasoning there so i wouldn't be surprised at all if if he's like you know some order of the Knights Radiant. I'm kind of assuming everyone's going to become one at some point. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I could definitely see that. And I think this is interesting. I I never really picked up much about the Envisagers, honestly. But I mean, looking at the, the details here about wanting, trying to bring out the, the Voidbringers and the Knights Radiant. I mean, it seems like Amber him. He's the head of the Knights Radiant now. Um, which is still kind of funny to me because, like, do do people even like know what a Knights Radiant like? They right. don't like know of anyone. Like, right? They're just like, all right, we have a. It's like the Space Force. I don't know if you're like a branch of the military for space. Like, <laughs> no. like okay, but like, what are you gonna do? Like, there's no one there, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm thinking of about this. Like cool you have this bridge to the military but like what no one's there like <laughs> um so so um yeah so I, I wouldn't be surprised either way <laughs> but it is it is kind of funny to me yeah that that's pretty but, pretty hilarious that, that's a pretty funny comparison <laughs> I, but i think the one thing i think the one thing in my mind that maybe is is arguing in the other direction though is that we saw so kaladin saved amaram's life right he was about to be killed by a shard bearer recently learned that was Helloran apparently. And Kaladin saves his life. Kaladin steps in and saves him. I, I want to believe that if Amram had powers, he would have used them in that moment. If he had some sort of surge binding ability, he would have used it to his own life there instead of needing Kaladin to save him. I mean, it's been 
years since that, right? At least a couple of like a year, yeah, two it's years. Been a, at this point, it's been like a year and a couple months or so. Right. So, so I guess theoretically he could have maybe picked up those powers between then and now, but I, I don't know. I, I would take that scene as maybe some evidence that he doesn't have supernatural powers, but I, I'm not writing it off for sure. That definitely, definitely could be possible. It's in the same vein as when Helleran threatens Lindavar. Why doesn't Lindavar summon a shard blade? Right. Exactly. Exactly. Since we've been jumping around all over in this episode, anyway, while we're talking about Amaram, I wanted to say a couple things about Amaram that come in chapter 75 real quick. Mm -hmm. So in, in 75, Kaladin and Shallan are back, but just before that, Dalinar is having a conversation with Amaram, and Amaram is pushing really hard to stop Dalinar from leaving on this expedition. He's 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 trying to come up with every reason he can why Dalinar should not do this. And that doesn't surprise me. We, we've seen from Shallan's espionage that he he has notes like get to the center first or, or something along those lines. So could totally, that's what where his motive is. He's He's got whatever his secret motive is. So he wants to make sure Dalinar doesn't get out there first. But then they also talk about the, the map I'll say that in quotes, the, the Herald Talonel that they have, and they're they're asking about him. And Amram kind of, he says something interesting here. He says, the, the story checks out. The madman did not have a shard blade. He just rants about it. And I had to pause here, like, you know, whoa, 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 second. One, he definitely did have a shard blade. And two, Dalinar doesn't know about it. I'd had totally that they they had known about his shard blade and that they were just you know had it in a box somewhere or he had given it to an officer or or something now we learn it's gone missing but amram's little story here seems very suspicious like perhaps amram has it and is covering it up the fact that it even existed so that's interesting it is interesting, and I'm really glad you picked this up on this because you're right. Dalinar is aware that he had a shard blade. So at or, this right at this point, he was told that's why they brought him to the Shattered Plains in the first place. He's mm -hmm. he could have just been a madman, but he had a shard blade, so they brought him to the Shattered Plains. So right at this moment, Dalinar knows that Amaram is lying to him. There there was a there there is a part in here, yeah, where where Dalinar does pause or like a moment of like he's testing Amaram. And right. I wasn't sure exactly what that was for. So so yeah, if Dalinar did know about the shard blade, then that makes sense that 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 this is him, you know, testing Amaram to see what he does. If you think back to our interlude with Talon. Uh, yes. Dalinar and Elokar are escorting him and Borden are escorting him to the Shattered Plains and they have his shard blade at the time. So they've mm. they've seen it. They it has gone missing at this point. We don't know where it is. But Dalinar knows that Amram is lying to him at this point. Gotcha. I had forgotten. I'm gonna have to go back and read that that interlude. I had forgotten to discuss there. So that actually makes that makes this segment make more sense now. So that yes, that could be huge. And uh in that same chapter, you're right, there are a couple lines in there where Dalinar is being very careful with what he's saying to Amram. He's saying steady, this needs to be very done very carefully. Mm -hmm. Navani is looking at him because he's talked to Navani about his plans for Amaram, whatever that means. So there are there are some very interesting dialogue here, but we don't. It's not resolved before the end of the part four here. So all right, so yeah, may, maybe very soon Dalinar is going to realize just how. The Amaram really is. 
uh, backing. Uh, we'll, we'll pause here. We'll come back to this here in a second. We need to talk about chapter 73. And it's a gross chapter. It's at some point, it's a relieving chapter because it it finishes to what we know Shalon's flashback chapters of it, it it puts her at the beginning of the way of kings where we where we met her at the beginning of the way of kings where her father has just died she needs to fix a soul caster uh, etc and this whole scene is creepy and gross and just like people killing people that they they love each other, but they also feel they need to do this. Uh, it's terrible. Do you, do you guys want to talk about it? Yes, I do. Um, this is uh, oh my gosh! Every Shalon flashback chapter just seems to get worse than the one before. Um, this was one where we we do find out like how Lindavar dies. Um, but it's it's just such like a a sad like series of events um and stuff and <clears throat> Shalon's hand is kind of like forced, I guess, and I don't know the dad just I, I, you'd asked before Trevor, like what could redeem him like what could bring his character back somehow and it, it's it just nothing happened he was just kind of bad all the way through right um until he died and yeah he tries to fight balat and it was kind of sick and twisted honestly with how he was like proud he was like, oh so you'll actually stand up and fight me like wow maybe you're not maybe you actually have a backbone like just insulting all the way through right and stuff um and you know beats Balot in I guess a duel like sort of and then just starts to like tear his leg up with a fire poker which was very like graphic yeah um I couldn't help but envision this I always envision it as like a tv series and I could just picture it being like a very like difficult to watch like hard scene and then resolved with the dad like Lynn dies um after being poisoned by Shalon and it's kind of just like a tough just a tough thing like overall like all the way around it's very difficult very heavy um and stuff and it seems that's how most of the Shalon flashback chapters go um so that's kind of the basis of what happened but with that, there's a lot of like questions that kind of need to be answered. Um, my biggest one, what I was looking for the most, is like Shalon with her shard blade. Does she have it? Did she get it from this? Like, I don't know. Something that uh, I'll let you talk here in a second, Elliot. But something that I forgot that was in this chapter is at the start of the chapter, Melise is dead. Lynn has killed Melise after Melise told him about their plans. And I like I genuinely forgot that that happened. I when I listened to it, I was listening to it this uh this time and I was like, "Wait, really?" <laughs> I didn't I didn't remember that, but he he just straight up kills her and that's what uh breaks Balot's back, if you will, to finally challenge him. Uh, and then Balot breaks the soul caster in the duel and stuff like that. But, uh, Elliot, go ahead. Well, it's even darker than you're, you're mentioning, you know, Balot, you know, kind of puts two and two together and says, oh, Malise, Malise told you that's where you learned. And, and Lindavar, he even says like, oh yes, she told eventually, eventually, like mm, yeah, implying that he tortured her to get it, you know, to get it out of her and then killed her. Like. Mm -hmm. Ugh, this was a this was a horrible chapter horrible in the sense of just you know horrifying dark very dark but i was i was going to talk about the shard blades so paul you mentioned the the shard 
the, the question. And Trevor, you, you said a, a moment ago that, you know, after this flashback, we're, we're, we're pretty much caught up with the Shallan we met way back way of Kings. And, and I think you're right with one notable exception, the shard blade, right? We, we've gotten answers to pretty much all of our questions at this point. There's definitely some unanswered things out, out there for sure. But as far as like major events where we're caught up, the biggest question though is, where did she get the shard blade? Because at no point along this journey did have we seen her use it or any implication that she has it in this mo in this moment. And I'd even kind of applying some of my similar logic to some of the other things we've already talked about. I I feel like this is another moment where if she had it, she would have used it. I think maybe not. Maybe she's you know wouldn't be confident enough or even remember that she has it. You know sometimes Shalon even like forgets that she has it. So. Maybe she wouldn't have pulled it out in this moment, but with, you know, he's about to murder her brother and, and she's willing to kill him. I would think she'd draw the shard blade to do it if she had it. Right. So I'm, I'm, I, that makes me want to guess that she doesn't have it at this point, but not a lot of time is going to transpire between point and when Shalon leaves to go after Yasna, where we first pick up with her at, at Way of Kings. So where is she going to get it from? I have I have a few little thoughts to interject. One, I think if she did have the shard blade, I don't think she would have pulled it out here. <laughs> Sorry. Because the only times that she so she's been in a situation before where like drawing it could potentially save someone else, but we've never seen her use it when someone else was in trouble only when she is which is like i guess there's a lot you could kind of dig into with that right but like i'm thinking specifically with like her and yasna um she doesn't do it the first time she does is with uh her name escapes me but the lady who attacked her tin that she was with her tin yes um that's when she does and then the only other time is like with the chasm fiend right whenever her life is in danger right then right there um so i could still see it, her having it and not pulling it out my guess as to when we'll get this answer is either in part five or and it'll be like with this situation like dad dies she gets the shard blade or something like that or at something way bigger and something maybe we're not expecting and if so i don't know when that would happen but those are in my mind. That's the only two like logical things that could happen with regard to that story or that detail. So there, there's a few other hints throughout this chapter that I feel like are pointing at something else that I just can't quite place at this point. It 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 mentions that when she when Shalon is in the poison to her father that she feels a coldness a coldness that she's only felt once before and it was on the day she lost like i don't quite know what to to make of that but that seems to be hinting at something and then as she's in the act of strangling him so he doesn't die from the poison he just kind of gets paralyzed and so shallan has to strangle him with her necklace which by the way, I'm not sure honestly why that takes it to another level for me, but strangling someone and poisoning them are very different. Yeah. You know, poisoning someone, I, I, it's murder either way, right? But, but poisoning someone is very different than using your own two hands to strangle the life out of someone while yeah. staring into their eyes as they, you know, the life passes out away from them. Like, I, I was not expecting that. I was not expecting Shalon to have murdered her father in such a brutal way. I thought it was, I originally thought it was going to be Shardblade. Then, you know, here comes Poison. Both of those are, you know, maybe not going to leave so much a mark on someone as actually two hands strangling someone. Just, I don't know, whole new level of. And then, of, and then she sings the creepy lullaby yes. as it's happening. Oh my and, gosh. Uh, like, what is 
what is what is your problem shallan why 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 are you doing this right why are you like this like please it, like do yes. anything else oh my right. God. right and so this it just shows the level of brokenness like that performing that act is going to break you that mm-hmm. is why shallan is broken like she is and why she has to shut those memories out and why she can't go there right. because not only did she kill her father she did it a brutal way that it is yeah going to absolutely haunt her for the rest of her life mm-hmm. on top of that actually going with originally is as she's doing that it describes the the look her father is giving her during this moment and it's not a look of anger it's not a look of you know oh my gosh you're killing me it's a look of betrayal and shalon says I think she whispers it. She says to him as he's dying, thank you for what you did for me. Other explanation than that. No other explanation for that. What in the world is that a hint to? Like, yes, we've kind of gotten this implied implication that throughout all this, that he's kind of been like protecting her a little bit, that he, you know, he never hurts her. He just hurts, you know, takes his anger out on, on people around her was he actually like protecting her from something it is i i don't know i honestly don't know how to like process all of this but i i feel like these are all hints to something else something even more here that's going on that i'm not sure what it is okay I have a few thoughts to get in order here. <laughs> this was a very like difficult chapter. Yes. And I, I want to touch briefly on what you said, Elliot, about like the way that Shalon killed her father, because this whole time I've just been, been envisioning that it was like a knife in the back situation, like to save her brother or someone. She like, you know, something quick, like stabs him in the back over like something like that. But the way it happened is actually like gotta be like the worst way. Like you said, like having to physically strangle, like that's just really like damaging. Um moving on from that, with that look or that thing we were talking about, like d- was the dad like protecting her in some way? It's going to have to be something astronomically like unseen to be justifiable because like if it was something that like she knew about and was like i don't know on some level of understanding with i don't think she would have like killed him like i don't think she would have gone through with it because she would have known she would have been very ups like obviously very upset he was like horribly abusive but i'm skeptical that if there was something else that she knew about that he knew about. I don't know if she would have killed him, but it could be something that Shalon didn't know about, right? And stuff. So it, it's complicated, I guess. But I'm almost discounting this as he's just a menace and horrible, and, and that's why Shalon is the way she is. Not that there was some like deeper seated thing going on with him. I do really want to know his backstory just because I can't imagine someone being so horrible, but um, it, it's very sad. This is like a very, like, very, like, depressing chapter. And it just had to end with the song. That was, <laughs> that was like, Our- straight, being completely honest, like, listening to it. Once it started in the audiobook, I was just like, all right, like, I'm not listening. Like, move on. <laughs> no, <Nope, Our>, no. <nope. laughs> yeah. Our first Shalon flashback chapter was a, a, a very short scene. It was like a page and a half. And it was Shalon getting carried out of the room by her father. And her mother is dead on the floor. And there's another man there. And her father is singing this lullaby to her to console her if you will and Mm -hmm. we get it here when she's killing her father strangling him to death and she's singing it to him 
The Devar family is... Uh... <laughs> the Devar family is. Yeah. I'll just okay. leave it there. Like... <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Any any more thoughts on 73 uh, before we jump back to uh, Kaladin and Shalon hiding out in a high storm? My only question moving forward is, is her backstory going to still go somewhere? Or is it just showing... Is it just showing us the reader insight on Shalon's character right. and, and what she went through? Um, I don't know if there's more significance there and, or not. But that's just something we'll see. If so, if there's more to it, cool. If not, we've gained a lot of like insight from it. So 